We're continuing our series in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' most well-known sermon. I was looking forward to preaching this series. Last week, Mike Hopper mentioned he was looking forward to this study until we got into it. I was looking forward to preaching this series. And each week it's gotten harder. Because as I've said, uh, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to the person that I see when I look in the mirror. And I'm facing, I'm facing the reality of Jesus speaking to me. As if I was sitting on the grassy hillside listening as Jesus said these things. Last week we saw that Jesus had something to say to me about not only murder, but about anger and hatred. And uh, that's continuing here this morning. Remember how Jesus began this section of his sermon by pointing out that he has not come to overturn or to set aside the requirements of the law, but to perfectly fulfill each and every point without exception, without fail. This is what he says. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. And then in verse 20, he says, for I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, I've read those same verses now three weeks, and they keep getting heavier, don't they? They keep getting heavier. We know only too well that we ourselves are certain to fail if it is up to us to qualify for entrance into heaven on our, on our merit alone, none of us has any hope of success. I'm glad that it doesn't rest on our merit, but on the one who did accomplish the keeping of the law perfectly. So we, we started this next section, this series of six uh, application, six case studies of this teaching of the law and its fulfillment. And I, and I, I showed you this last week, and we're going to continue this over the next several weeks. Uh, six statements Jesus makes. You have heard that it was said. And then he says, but I say to you, and we're looking for relief. We're looking for relief when, when you have heard that it was said, that's hard. What, it, what was said is hard to do. So we're looking for relief. We're looking for Jesus to give us an easier way. When he says, but I say to you, we're saying yes. The loophole. And what he says is so much harder. Last week we talked about how it's not just, you can't just say, well, I never killed anybody. Because even posting your least favorite person's picture uh, on top of the dartboard that hangs on the back of your bedroom door and then perforating it with tiny dart holes even that is wrong in God's sight. Last week was hard, but this week's message is even harder. You have heard that it was said, Jesus continues, verse 27 of Matthew 5. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. Uh-oh. It's the sex talk. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. 
But I say to you, that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Oh boy. I wonder if we were to take a survey of the room, how many of us uh, had at some point a poster of Farrah Fawcett or <laughs> Linda Carter as Wonder Woman or any one of a thousand other seemingly attractive women in this generation? Because that dated me when I said Farrah Fawcett <laughs> and Linda Carter. Daisy Duke. But also, how many of us might have had similar posters of Luke or Bo Duke or Steve Majors, the six million dollar man, or little Joe Cartwright? Cartwright. Maybe Haas. <laughs> or any one of a thousand other seemingly attractive men. And what did, this, what did those posters on our bedroom walls represent for us? Let me show you a picture. See if you recognize this face. You'll probably recognize this photograph of Jimmy Carter, 39th President of the United States. He served in the office of President from 1977 to 1981. Everybody in the room my age and older remembers. During his presidential campaign in 1976, he gave a very controversial magazine interview. Some of you are already nodding your heads. He was interviewed by a journalist representing Playboy magazine. Some of you remember. That published interview proved one thing for certain. Some people actually did read that magazine for the articles. <laughs> Contrary to popular opinion at the time. I did not read that article at that time in my life. Uh, but I have since found that you can find the article without the magazine. Thankfully. Thankfully. You will remember what made this interview so controversial and shocking was one particular statement that then Governor Carter made. Here's his quote. I've looked on a lot of women with lust. I've committed adultery in my heart many times. He was running for president. He was governor of the state of Georgia. And here he is admitting to having lustful thoughts. He says, this is something that God recognizes I will do and God forgives me for it. Scandalous. A person who would presume to lead the entire nation would say something like this and have it published in a publication like that. I was too young to vote yet uh, in this presidential election, but that article was released in November 1976, right before the election. Probably not a coincidence. Maybe uh, somebody thought that would sway popular opinion toward the opposite candidate. But it turns out Mr. Carter was elected even in the face of that scandalous admission. Here's something else that was published in that same article. Another statement that he made. I can't, I can't change... The teachings of Christ. 
I believe in them. And a lot of people in this country do as well. I can get behind that statement. I can't change the teachings of Christ either. I can't even avoid this part of his teaching. Much as I wished I would find a legitimate excuse to let Pastor Tim preach this sermon. (laughs) But I wouldn't do that to him either. Maybe Ben. (laughs) No, I wouldn't do that to him either. Just another word about uh, President Carter. From a young age, he showed a deep commitment to Christianity. In 1942, 1942, 34 years before being elected to president, he was elected to the office of deacon in his church. He uh, was a member of the same church all of these years and still to this day, still living. He'll, he'll be 98 years old this fall, if he lives. And he, I think, uh, maybe not still, but until recently, if not still, teaches Sunday school in the same church he served as a deacon in 1942, Maranatha Baptist Church. As president, Carter prayed several times a day, and he professed that Jesus was the driving force in his life. Carter had been greatly influenced by a sermon he had heard as a young man. The sermon asked, and maybe you've heard this too, I certainly have, if you were arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? In the year 2000, Carter uh, severed his membership with the Southern Baptist Convention, saying that the group's doctrines did not align with his Christian beliefs. In 2007, he co-founded the New Baptist Covenant Organization for Social Justice. Yet he was guilty of adulterous thoughts. He said, I know God knows, but I also know that God forgives me. Jesus goes on to say this in Matthew 5, 29. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out, throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your, your whole body be thrown into hell. And he says, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. Is Jesus actually telling us to self-mutilate? No. This is, this is hyperbole. But what he is saying is, discipline yourself Get rid of that part in you that is fouling you. Adultery is the word. Extramarital sex. But I'm sure that premarital sex is included. Casual sex. Curious sex. Experimentation. Sex, try on the shoes before you buy them, sex. What a cynical way to think about the thing that God created to be perfect. The perfect representation of unity. Sensuality, sexuality, pornography... These words and what they represent make us uncomfortable, don't they? Do you know that if you drive the right car, you will get the most attractive women? That's what, that's what the car companies tell you. Do you know that if you use Axe body spray men, women will throw themselves at you? Do you know that if you use Old Spice shower soap, you will be irresistible to women? 
You see, our culture uses sex as the enticement. We're so cynical about it. We're so casual about it. We're so thoughtless about it. We're so mindless about it. Remember this truth. We introduced it last week. Obedience to God is not only outward, but it is also, and it is even more importantly, inward. And this principle applies to my own sexuality, my own appetites, my own fantasies, my own viewing and reading and thinking habits. It applies to those things as, it, as much as and even more so than any of those thoughts that produce actions. I'm thankful that most of my thoughts never, never result in actions. Because actions other people see. But thoughts are private. Only one other knows my thoughts. Remember I mentioned to you last week. Uh, God sees not only my actions but also my thoughts. My motives, my intentions. The more I live as a Christian, the more control I have had, I have found over my actions, but it's still my thoughts that must be surrendered and submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Here's, here's some help from uh, other parts of Scripture. Romans 12, too. This, is, this, is, this verse is familiar to anyone who's been in church twice. If you've been in church twice, you know John 3.16. And, and Romans 12, 1 and 2. Probably. I know that's hyperbole. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and what is acceptable and what is perfect. You and I are in the middle of a battle. It's raging all around us, and it takes place on that real estate that occupies the space between my left ear and my right ear. That's the battlefield. That's the battleground. And how does one go about fighting that battle that is happening inside here when I don't choose every thought that comes into my mind? Here's some help from Philippians 4, 8, and 9. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. How do I manage my thought life? One of the ways that I can help manage my own thought life is to flood my thoughts, to flood my mind with these things that are noble and excellent and admirable and things about which I have no need to feel shame or guilt. And when the tempting thought comes in, as it does... I must learn to discipline my mind to reject the tempting thought and fill its place with these positive things, reminding myself of what is good. There's a discipline required to take charge of my thoughts. I didn't put these verses on the screen for this morning, but you might want to write these references down. I left a little room in the bulletin. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 to 6. I'll read them for you. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but they have divine power to destroy strongholds. Think about for a minute what is meant by a stronghold here. A stronghold in my mind is, is a thought, a tempting thought that keeps coming back. 
something that I have a weakness about, something that I will give space to in my thoughts, whatever it might be. That's a stronghold in my mind that must be rooted out. Paul goes on to say in that same verse, We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God, and we take every thought captive to obey Christ. When that tempting thought enters, I identify it. I point it out. I say, in my own mind, I say, you are not allowed to be here. Be gone. If I have to use language like, the blood of Jesus Christ has cleansed me, and there is no place for this thought here anymore, I will not linger on you. Go away. And if necessary, replace that thought with words of Scripture. When I was a, a, newly, a newlywed... I was working in a construction industry, and, and we were converting uh, research laboratories, uh, renovating them and updating them, and we were doing one laboratory at a time while the employees of the labs continued to work. And we would be working in a construction area, and men and women who were employed there walked back and forth all day. And my um, co-workers... Uh, would comment out loud about uh, some of the women as they walked past. And it was causing me difficulty in my mind. I had enough sense to keep my foolish mouth shut, but I was still learning to discipline my mind. And so to help, I took an index card and I wrote on that index card the words of uh, 1 Corinthians 10.13. I carried that with me in my shirt pocket. And I remember uh, sitting at the top of a ladder, a step ladder, working on a suspended ceiling uh, in that lab while others were working around me and having to stop, put my tools down and take my index card out and read over it while the people around me were talking about whatever it was they were talking about or whoever it was that had just walked by. And... Uh, I kept that index card in my pocket until I no longer needed the index card. Not because my mind was now under control, but because I had committed the words of that verse to my memory. There has no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability to bear it, but will with the temptation provide a way of escape. And I discipline my mind to say, Dennis, look for the way to escape this thought. Now, I'd like to say that I have mastered my mind. I'd like to say that I have complete control over every random thought that comes into my mind. I'm not there yet. But I know that God is available to help me exercise authority over my own thoughts. Paul finishes that thought in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 9. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Here's something that Job learned in mastering this in his own mind something like 5,000 years ago. 5,000 years ago, righteous Job Someone about whom God boasted. Have you seen my servant Job? He said to the devil. Have you seen my servant Job? But Job also knew his own weakness. And so he says this in Job 31.1. I have made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a young woman. I've made a covenant with my eyes. I am learning to master my own thoughts. 
and bring my own flesh under the authority of God's word. We, we, like Job, must actively and aggressively take authority over our own minds, our own thoughts, to bring them into submission to Christ. Now, I don't have to do this myself. I don't have to have this kind of spiritual maturity on my own because I don't. But I don't have to do it alone. I have the Holy Spirit in me. The fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, 22. The, the help that God has given to me. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. Against these things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified, have executed, have put to death the flesh with its passions and desires. Another verse from Galatians that helps me here. I didn't put this one on the screen either. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. There's help. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, I discipline my body and I keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. There's so much at stake. I think about this from time to time. I remind myself of this. There's so much at stake. There's so much to lose if I should fail. If I should fail as a husband. If I should fail as a father. If I should fail as a pop. Grandfather for those of you that don't understand the pop reference. If I should fail as a Christian leader, if I should fail as a testimony, if I should fail as an example, there's so much at stake. So sometimes I ask God as I begin my day in, in my personal devotion time, God, when the temptation uh, comes at me today, I said when, not if, when the temptation comes at me today, Lord, would you give me one clear moment of thought before I am overwhelmed. Would you give me one clear moment of thought? Would you let me see a little bit down the road into the future? What would happen if I gave in to this temptation and it became known? What would I stand to lose? There are too many examples of people who have lost because they did not discipline themselves to resist the tempting thought. The tempting thought was allowed to take root until it became an action and then perhaps a habit of action, a destructive habit. A reaction. I discipline my body, keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself, I myself should be disqualified. Pray for me, please. If you think about it, pray for me. I'll pray for you. For the second week in a row, I'm going to finish in the book of 1 John. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. Do not love the world. My little children, John says, do not love the world. Or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, listen to these three things. This, this encapsulates every temptation. All that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the appetites of the flesh, and the desires of the eyes, the things that I see and because I see it I want it. And the pride of life. Some translations say the boastful pride of life. Look at me. I can handle this. This has no power over me. I can handle this. I can, do, I can get away with this. Who will know? 
who will believe. All of these things, it's not from the Father, but it's from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. This struggle that we're in, this struggle is not forever. I'm not saying it's going to get easier before it's done. I'm not making that promise that it's going to be easier the older I get. But it's not forever. And the victory has already been won. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you know how you know how much I did not want to give this message today. You know how awkward and uncomfortable it seemed to me to talk about these things that we don't like to talk about. Maybe if we talked about them more, they wouldn't have the secret power that they have over us. But I do pray, Father, that we will avail ourselves of the help that you have already given to us, the Holy Spirit dwelling in me that helps me to recognize the tempting thought when it comes and helps me to take authority over it. And uh, by your word and the power that is in your word, you give us the ability to turn the tempting thought away. We seek for that, that designation, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Help us, purify us, help us to discipline our minds and take every, every random thought captive under the authority of Christ in Jesus' name.
holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. You have called us to be holy. So help us to do that this week with our thoughts and our lives, God. Help us to take control of those thoughts by your power and your strength. You have called us to be holy, so let's be holy. We thank you, we love you, and we give you all the praise in Jesus' name.